I'm very pleased now to invite to the podium the next panel on agricultural innovation and to introduce to you its moderator, Dr. Eleni Gabri Madden, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ethiopia Commodity Exchange. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the nearly last session, I believe, of uh, this uh, really amazing day. Uh, I have kept having to pinch myself uh, throughout the morning, just realizing um, that we're really here, that this really is Africa's moment, that these things that we've been dreaming about, and some of us since our college days, are uh, hoping that in our lifetime, uh, this haunting specter of famine will be taken seriously and addressed. And as an Ethiopian, I can tell you that I've spent most of my adult life um, haunted by this, by this uh, very problem. So that said, um, I want to go back to what uh, Josette said in the, her opening remarks in the preceding session and uh, remember that uh, comment uh, at the Grow Africa session last week about the PPPP, uh, which includes people. And I want us to think about what does the face of Africa look like today? Uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 60% of Africans today are below the age of 25. So who are these young Africans? What are their aspirations? They aspire to be uh, entrepreneurs, to be uh, uh, innovators, to be socially connected, tech savvy, uh, and to make a change. Uh, so, when we talk about innovation, and I was uh, amazed at the, at the uh, lunchtime session where we heard uh, some really, really interesting ideas uh, by young and old, uh, older innovators, and, um, and you could see the, the power of these ideas and how they can spread, uh, and uh, really you know, felt very energized by that. And I, I was thinking that, you know, uh, when we were talking at lunch about uh, ideation labs and uh, data palooses and uh, farmer idol uh, on YouTube as opposed to American Idol um, or as a variant of American Idol. I was thinking that, you know, fundamentally, innovation is about connecting ideas and people. Uh, and so, uh, as was said today at lunch, the best ideas can come from anywhere uh, and everywhere and from anyone. So uh, they're not confined to people in white coats in uh, well-lit laboratories. Uh, they're not confined to the people uh, on the top floor of, of glass buildings. Uh, they are all around us, these ideas, uh, and they look like, like us. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce you to a very uh, illustrious panel that in fact represents the entire value chain uh, of where in agriculture those ideas uh, may spring from. So I'm going to start uh, from uh, my um, uh, far left. Uh, Jack Sinclair is a senior vice president at Walmart, uh, executive vice president, sorry, of grocery merchandise at Walmart. Uh, Jeff Simmons is uh, the senior vice president at Eli Lilly. Uh, we have Janet uh, Chigabatia Adama, who is the managing director of the Savannah Farmers Marketing Company. Uh, on my immediate right, I have uh, Hugh Grant, the Chairman, President, and CEO of Monsanto. Uh, Sam Dryden, uh, Director uh, of Agricultural Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And on my far right, but in fact, the beginning of the value chain, uh, a farmer, uh, uh, Daiborn Chibonga, who represents and is the executive, Chief Executive Officer of the National Association uh, of Smallholder Farmers of Malawi. So with that, um, I would like to start really uh, from the, um, uh, the, the question about how is our understanding uh, of this value chain and the holistic approaches that really have now become uh, almost conventional thinking uh, when in fact, you know, just some years ago, we all were all in our silos thinking about research uh, and breeding as one separate activity and marketing as something completely different. So Hugh, let me start with you and ask, um, how does this holistic uh, um, thinking uh, on the value chain, how does that impact on investments in agricultural research and innovation technologies? No, I think it's the heart of it. So I'm very pleased to be here. This is a very cool day 
and it's been a long time coming. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of this. The, the value chain and how we look at R&D within that, we're a seed company. Uh, we breed seed, and we breed seed pretty much everywhere that there's agriculture around the world. And you have to breed seed close to where the market is. I think the learning that I've personally come to gather is seed's important. It's kind of the beginning of the journey, but seed on its own <clears> isn't <throat> enough. Um, you can have great seed and a broken value chain and the result is misery. So if you think about the business, it starts with scraping a hole in the ground or pushing a wooden stick in the ground and dropping a seed in. And from there, you need to know a lot about the soil. Today, we know more about the soil on Mars than we know about the soil in Africa. A lot more about the soil on Mars than we know about the current soil maps in Africa. Um, my colleagues were here earlier talking about fertilizer and how you feed that tiny little vulnerable uh, plant. Is distribution and where the farmer accesses those products is grain collection and then eventually it's, it's marketing. And at the end of all that, you know, the popular banker, the Rabobank, you have finance. So as we look at our commitment to this and we look at R&D, um, we're investing in, in seed. We're investing heavily in partnerships because we can't get this done on our own. This takes concerted effort to build partnerships. Often where at the beginning there's no trust. I always say it's, it's hard enough to build a marriage and you love that individual. Um, building partnerships with people you've never met before takes a little bit more time. A quick story from Malawi. I arrived in a village in Malawi. All the kids in the village were underneath a big tree. The school was being held out in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the clearing. And yet there was a brand new schoolhouse there. Brand new two room schoolhouse. The school, I said, so what's the deal? Is it too warm to be inside? The schoolhouse was filled with corn. Malawi has gone from being a recipient of aid to a marketeer of grain. But the point from a value chain point of view is you, you can have the best yields you've ever seen, but if you can't store, market, transport that grain, then you have a supply chain that doesn't work. So as we think about R&D, and we've done a lot of this with the Gates Foundation and partners in Africa in the last five years, a great deal of this is R&D with a community and making those early tentative steps and sharing technology, sharing experiences and building trust. And you have to start at some point. In our business, spring happens once a year everywhere in the world. And if you're late, you're 11 and a half months early for the next spring. <laughs> so I'm optimistic. I'm as optimistic as a Scot can be. Jack? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm optimistic, but I am extraordinarily impatient. And I hope we're back here in a year's time talking about what we've done yeah. rather than the hypothesis of what we could do. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to next spring and taking that step. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we've been throwing the challenge that we're not going to have as many meetings. So it That's will right. be a whole year. <laughs> That's right. Um, that said, uh, now let's think about what you just said and, and the fact that it's putting the seed in the ground. And who puts the seed in the ground but the farmer? So let's uh, turn over to Dyborn and get your sense, Dyborn, of what has worked and what hasn't in terms of adoption uh, and engagement. Because I think um, uh, where, where Hugh went in his remarks really is where I think we need to, to push further, is that sense of engagement with the community. Uh, so it's not a seed being parachuted into a, into, a, into a farming community, but really a joint engagement and a sense of partnership. So what are your thoughts about that? Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here to represent Mohoda farmers across Africa and especially in Malawi. Uh, what has worked is that uh, Mohoda farmers have to turn from traditional farming to tr farming as business. Mm -hmm. So farmer mobilization, farmer organization is of uh, prime concern that uh, everything that we are talking about here cannot happen if farmers are not mobilized. Yeah. Having said that, what has not worked is the extension delivery system that we used to have in the 60s, 70s, 80s has not worked because government extension systems have broken down for various reasons. Uh, what is now working across Africa is a, a farmer-led extension system. Some places they call it farmer field schools, other places they call it farmer-to-farmer farmer, uh, extension system. 
that is working because these are farmers that have been chosen by the farmers. They are good at production, they are good at communication, and they are able to use their farms as demonstration plots. So that while it's a seed company, a chemical company, uh, or a research station, they can do training, they can do field days on those farmers' fields. And because seeing is believing, others <coughs> around them can come and learn and go back and apply that. Yeah. Hmm. Having said that, because of the changes in the climate and other challenges, one other system that is working is production of seeds by farmers themselves. Mm -hmm. Developing short to medium term varieties that are better adapted at the climate rather than the long term uh, seeds that uh, have been there traditionally. Another thing that is working now is conservation agriculture. The picture uh, above me there is showing a farmer with a hoe. What is happening now is that conservation agriculture is taking root in the part of the world where I come from, where we are saying throw away the hoe. And using conservation agriculture methods, you can be able to plant, you can be able to weed, you can be able to manage your crop by the least disturbance to the soil, having maximum biomass and manuring the soil so that you can produce two to three times the use that you used to have. Oh, one more important thing that I can mention here is that uh, having production is not enough. You need to be able to control what you've produced. Yeah. I think we've all heard of 40% loss of yields that have been obtained across Africa. One of the reasons is aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a mycotoxin that is produced by uh, a fungus. And some of the maize, especially, that is produced across Africa is lost to mycotoxins, especially aflatoxin. One thing that is being developed in Africa is the partnership for aflatoxin control in Africa. That is ensuring that what has been produced and stored is fit for human consumption. Most of the time we talk about nutrition, but we don't look at the safety aspects of the food. Mm. So keeping that food and making sure that it is aflatoxin free is key to make sure that we have food that is there not only to feed Africa, but also for the future to feed the world. Excellent, excellent. That's uh, really inspiring. Thank you. Now, you, just to pick up on a point you made, uh, Diaborn, around the post-harvest losses and uh, the support, really, that we need to build uh, into, the, into the chain, let me uh, turn over to Jeff uh, sure. from Eli Lin, uh, Lilly and hear some of your uh, thoughts about how we can partner better um, and the public-private sort of models that we've been talking about all day. Uh, how do they come into, into Absolutely. play? Absolutely. So I represent Elanco, which is a leader in the animal side, which we haven't talked a lot about today. So innovators in meat, milk, and uh, eggs. 50% of protein consumption by most developing countries comes in that source. And so that's the essence of what, what we do. And there's 3 billion of the 7 billion people working to get off that plant and rice diet and bring in some animal-based protein for the first time. So I think in the context of an of a innovation model, I agree with, with Hugh, uh, we've never seen more innovation. Uh, we had record innovation and in approvals last year, but I think it's changing the model and it's collaborating across the private, the public, and, and bringing in the governments as well. I, I would say three things real quick. Like One is you got to change the context. Mm -hmm. Our story has changed. Six years ago, after 58 years as a company, we had to walk into a 12-member board of directors and say, we no longer are in the animal business, we're in the people business. We enrich lives. We make food, more of it, more affordable, and we make it safe. And by changing that context, I looked around at my other seven presidents, president of diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, cancer. What, what's differentiated there very clearly is that we are dealing with something bigger than them. We not just have one out of six people that are struggling with not having enough food, but you, you know, the context has changed. 43% of the world lives on $2 a day or less. One out of four people in developed worlds are struggling to put food on the table. And the message to them is more people live with food as an issue every day than not. And frankly, I look to all my colleagues and say, and none of your drugs work if the people aren't properly nourished. Mm -hmm. We are first in line. And in the last five years, we've had more invested in our innovation than the last 52 years before because of the change, I think, in the context. So I think changing the context is important. The good news in that, though, is we don't have the answer to Alzheimer's yet or cancer. We have the answer in this room to this issue. That's the exciting thing to say we need to chase after this because with collaboration and with the innovation we have, we can solve this. 
The second, though, we talked a little bit about at dinner last night, and that is, I think, sorry, but I don't think the, the leadership that's really going to solve this in the next 50 years, because this is the biggest issue and biggest opportunity, and Africa is probably the best continent of opportunity in the next 50 years. It won't be us in this room. It'll be the next generation behind us. Mm -hmm. And we need to not have people running off from rural areas, from Iowa to Zambia, to go to the urban areas or move into the phone business. We've been on a 30 campus tour the last six months, highlighting this is the hot area. Mm -hmm. Not engineering, not medical. Not, if over 50% of Africans are under 25, there's one common thing around the world I've learned about 25 year olds or less. They wanna become part of something bigger than them. And I don't think there's anything that's more important than something that's bigger than them that impacts economics, environment, and everything. And I would say our engagement scores five years ago were 46%. That's the U.S. current average. We introduced a heifer project where we're going to bring 100,000 families out. We have a project in Zambia, 6,000 families where we've turned over goats and chickens, and we've, we, we make employees go there. We give employees a half a day, a quarter, go see a hungry face. This is, the, this is the business we're in. Today, engagement's 92%. Past Zappo shoes and Apple computer being an innovation company in animals. I think we change the context, we change the cause and the engagement of our people, and then suddenly innovation flows. And on innovation, I think innovation's not inside. I think he would agree, innovation's all over. We saw it at lunch today. And so we've blown up our innovation model. We moved off our our research farm of over 50 years, knocked all the buildings down, moved into a, a, a separate building and said, we will innovate anywhere and everywhere. Nine products approved last year, seven of them were not from us. Last week I was in six hours south of Beijing, China, in a small dairy farm that's a research farm that has a compound that may unlock the immunity of a dairy cow to allow a dairy cow in Asia and Africa to produce 30% more with no antibiotics, and that came from four researchers, again, six hours from Beijing. So to me, change the context, change the cause, unlock the heart of the next generation. We need to not make them, there's curious people, there's committed people. I've met a lot of people here, though, that are more, more than committed. They're convicted. They're cause-centered leaders. That creates innovation, and that changes the context. Go. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. This is, this is going well beyond where I thought we would go, so this is already exciting. But I'm gonna, before I come uh, to Janet, let me just throw that concept back uh, to Hugh. The, we are not in the animal business, we are in the people business. Um, and Hugh, I want you to just uh, maybe come back to that point and let's think about how we can do uh, what what uh, Dyborn was talking about, uh, seed uh, production, but not only production, but breeding itself in this open uh, environment, in a, in a variation maybe of open source yep. uh, code development uh, in the software uh, sphere. Can we apply uh, that sense of a, a crowdsourcing? You know, Africa, uh, during the elections, a young woman uh, by the name of Ori Okello um, in Kenya uh, started up a crowdsourcing uh, model yep. where instead of hearing journalists reporting from a distance with sort of fed information about what was happening uh, on elections in Kenya, people started to feed into the reports and the story came from the crowd. Yep. Uh, and uh, so let's think about whether we can change the seed business um, and, and maybe challenge you a little on that. Yeah, no, we've, we've, um, we, we've been working on that now for four years. Um, so it's a triangle. Um, and the triangle kind of spans the globe and it's a model that frankly Norm Borlaug started, Norm's granddaughter's here today, Julie. Um, so it, it spans the globe, so it's a crowd, but it's a spread out crowd. There's two places in the world eat white corn, Mexico and Africa. In Africa, they make porridge, in Mexico, they make tortillas. Um, so the crowd reaches around the world. We work with CGIR in Mexico. They help with the breeding that then backs into local breeding in Africa. We provide the technology and the Gates Foundation and Howard Buffett's foundation um, funded a seven year program because it takes time even with a crowd. Mm -hmm. so there's no shortcuts in biology. So it's about seven years from start to finish. 
I, I agree. <coughs> the, the biggest single piece of this was not the technology. And we provided all that royalty free. So that was our open architecture model. It was a completely free system. The limiting factor in this, and it's why I'm so excited about this meeting, the limiting factor in this wasn't the gee whiz nature of the technology, yeah. which is really gee whiz. But that wasn't the choke point. The challenging part in this was bringing the crowd together mm -hmm. and building a trust where when you say, this is really interesting, somebody steps forward instead of stepping back. Mm -hmm. And the early years in the project, there was much more energy, much more than I ever expected. There was much more energy dedicated to the people mm -hmm. and the glue that holds people together than there was in the breeding conventional seed, biotechnology, the transfer of, of breeding material between world areas. Mm -hmm. It gets down to how you bring groups together and how you start to compress the imaginary gaps. And very often we come into rooms like this and we know who our friends are and we know who we're really worried about. Mm. And if you think about seven years to develop something new, there's no time for that. <laughs> there is no time for two years of getting to know each other and worrying about is what you say, what you mean. And I think that's one of the biggest rate limiting steps. And it's why this meeting, for me personally, I've learned a bunch here today and a lot of what I've learned today, again, is people interaction and how we can build those bridges faster because there isn't a lot of time to spare. So that's, that's, right. that, that's my side. Well, you know, you said um, uh, to that uh, comment about the glue, the glue. Uh, one of the glues uh, <laughs> that brings people together uh, is the market. Hmm. Uh, and there's nothing like a market to give you a signal back to where you started. So Janet, let me turn to you because you run the Savannah Farmers Marketing Company in Northern Ghana uh, and you have 12,000 farmers that you are helping find markets for. So how do you react to, uh, to this uh, discussion and, and what do you see are, as some of the pressing uh, problems uh, in what you're trying to do, which is take what farmers have and get it to market to the buyers and then hopefully loop back uh, and uh, shape uh, innovation uh, in the, in the uh, technology uh, of production. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be part of this, uh, some, uh, this meeting. Uh, we are a small company, actually a farmer-owned company in the northern part of Ghana. The north is known as the breast basket of the country. At the same time, the north is the, uh, the, the, they have the highest poverty rates. So being the breadbasket means there are a lot of opportunities for production to feed the country. Yet we, ha we have the highest rate of poverty staring us in our face. So what this company tries to do is to use the pool mechanism where we encourage the farmers to produce and then pool them to the market. Mm -hmm. Once there's a market for the product, the farmers will be interested in doing it. But we still have very basic issues to deal with. One of it being seed. We think there should be an effort to research into drought resistant seeds because uh, following the climate change, now it's a bit difficult to predict the rain pattern. For example, last year, rice farmers were faced with that type of disaster. Just when rice was seeding, the rain stopped. So we, are, we as a market, when it happens that way, we have problems with our end buyers because we have signed contracts to supply certain volumes and we are unable to do that because we, you, you don't get the yield that uh, you expected. We also still have issues of uh, just having one season in that region. It's just one season that spans from May to around September and that's it for the rest of the year. We will want to see some research into the possibility of using dugouts or underground water to be propelled by gravity to reach as many farmers as uh, we can so that uh, it will improve upon the production volumes that we need yes. to supply industry. And then it will also get the farmers to be focused. For the whole of the 12 years, they, they, they will be engaged on their farms. 
and that will help us a lot. Instead of the one season that we have, after the one season, that's it, and then there's nothing for them to do. We also will want to see a situation where um, there could be encouragement of uh, agribusiness entrepreneurship. We have agri graduates coming out of school and rather head for other jobs and not practicing what they have gone to learn. So we think uh, the environment should be, be available for them to pick up uh, and practice what they have learned uh, in, in school. We still have issues of access to land by women. We have issues like uh, this is a woman's crop, this is a man's crop. Mm. We think these things should cease. If a woman has a capacity, the land must be made available. The man should be ready to share the land with the woman so that uh, as we go on, at least it will up the production volumes that we, we normally would look for. So the bigger pr uh, picture is for the, the governments to take care of. Um, that is roads, infrastructure. I was happy to hear our president mention that there are certain infrastructure issues that uh, you cannot leave that to the private sector alone and you need to partner with them to get roads to the high producing areas so that marketers like us can reach out to those farmers and support them to bring their produce to cleaning centers where we can clean and package and send to the industry. And there's a very big market for the cross we deal, we deal in. See. So really, you know, we've, we've talked about the, the seeds, the services, uh, the, the farmers, uh, and these issues that you really uh, brought us to, Janet, which uh, when we're thinking about markets, it's about all the, the pieces that need to be there. Uh, and so for, with that, let me turn to uh, a very important other bridge, which is the role of the public sector, the role of policy, the role of capacity build, uh, building, uh, and uh, generally that the, the glue uh, to bring all of these pieces together. And let me turn to Sam uh, from the Gates Foundation uh, to give us some sense of, uh, first of all, the simple but very difficult uh, question, which is what will it take to get it all together? Uh, and uh, and how does an, how does a public sector institution like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or, or other uh, development uh, partners how do how do they come in and 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 bridge across all these things that that really um, end up being all pieces of this uh, challenge that we're trying to solve? Well, let me let me start first by thanking the Chicago Council for putting this very successful and frank uh, exchange of, of ideas before us because this is one of the most successful that we've seen. And also compliment our former colleagues from the Gates Foundation that, that at USAID that have led this. And so Raj and Jada and here, here. Melissa, they've done a great job and I think we ought to give everyone applause. So, what it takes, we think, is we, we need to start where a lot of people have talked about it today, and that's with the smallholder. That in our strategy, we're very smallholder centric. And if you start out with that, then you're dealing with, with the real problems and the real issues that need to be solved. And then it goes all along the value chain. But you know, it starts with the fact that the smallholder is not just a producer, not just a business person, but is a member of the family, a member of the community. And at that level, they have their own personal tastes, their own personal customs. And we have to be respectful of those things. And we have to, to deal with the, the crops that they want to eat and they want to grow. And so what we do at the foundation is we, we work in, in those crops and in the livestock that, that's important to them. Then we work at the other elements of the value chain all the way uh, up uh, to, the, uh, to the market where you are. But it's, it's important to, to have an innovation system that, that can service that. And like we were hearing Bono say uh, earlier today, and we heard Strive talk about it as well, I mean, this is a new era. It's a very new era. And it's, it's an era that, that where the technologies are changing fast all along the value chain. So whether it's at the genomics or whether it's at the uh, satellite imagery or whether it's uh, at ICT uh, for the farmer, there's innovation occurring all, all along the value chain, and it's occurring everywhere in the world. And so you have to be open to, to new models for the innovation. We particularly look at, at some of the old models of, that, that worked in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and we say it's time to change those models as well. No longer can you have just fixed institutions 
that, uh, that are centric, but they need to actually be part of a, of a whole system. So we're working along the whole system to try to, to try to create new systems that are open for technological change, that, that train people for, for uh, the types of changes that are occurring. We're, we're also looking at new models. I mean, in, in Ethiopia, I mean, we have the Agricultural Transformation uh, Agency there. In Nigeria, you know, uh, Akeen's been bringing uh, new models into there. Uh, so all, everywhere we see these new models. We also think that there are important new models where Jack is, is working, which is in the grocery and in the, uh, in, in, in the industrial food processing area, because you know, the, the Western models aren't the models for Africa or for the parts of Asia where we're serving. And again, it comes back to the smallholder, what they and what their communities want to eat and, and what they want to, uh, to grow. And so we think that, that at that end of the spectrum, there's going to have to be innovation as well. Okay. Let me, let me push you, uh, Sam, on something that you said that I think um, is really fundamental, which is that, you know, if you think, and this is very stylized, but if you think of the old model as being taking technology and worrying about how it gets adopted, uh, the new model maybe is not so much how you take the technology and transfer it, but how you create the capacity uh, for technological uh, innovation. Uh, in the places where that technology is needed. So to that extent, part of that, of course, is uh, some of the work that, uh, for example, Gates is doing, uh, or m maybe even Agra, uh, better put, uh, on, uh, on uh, building capacity among scientists uh, on the continent. Uh, but let's, let's talk about how, how we build that capacity, whether it's in farm communities, whether it's in, uh, in the knowledge community, uh, or uh, you know, up, the, up the chain. Um, well, you heard Strive talk about the success Agra's had with PASS, and, and that's, that's one that's been very successful. Uh, and it's capacity building. It's putting a lot of, uh, of capacity in place. But it's also doing something that, that's ages old, which is something that Dybarn was talking about, which is that, that a lot of the seed industry in the world starts with the farmer. And so what actually happens is that, I mean, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of value added to make Monsanto or, or Syngenta be interested in a crop. It's got to have a good margin to it. And most of the crops that we're dealing with as of right now don't have those kind of margins. So what do you do to, to create you know, the, the stimulus for that? Well, you, you have to have farmers that are, that are the elite farmers in their area that actually become the, the producers of excess seed. And the, that surplus of seed, they, they ought to have the opportunity to, to register it as certified seed. And then they have the opportunity to brand it and then they supply their, their neighbors in the community. And that happens all over the place because, again, seed is local. The same thing is true with livestock. You know, it's, it, the genetics make it all local. And so you have to build the capacity that, the, that this can happen in the policy level as well. Exactly. Now, we talked about everything, and uh, Sam uh, referred to the one thing that we haven't yet talked about, which is the presence of the retail uh, and the giant uh, in the room, at least on this panel, uh, which is Walmart. And it's been referred to several times during the day that Walmart has come to Africa. And we heard also the example of PepsiCo driving uh, investments uh, in the chickpea uh, value chain in Ethiopia. So let me turn to Jack and say you are in Africa. That's extremely exciting. Uh, and you're here. Uh, so what, what are your perspectives as the represented from the retail side uh, of our value chain on how we link back all the way to the beginning of the chain. Yeah, I've never been described as a giant before, so that's very complimentary, <laughs> but Walmart occasionally does. We, um, we have got, we're super excited to be here today. It's a, it's a real privilege to be part of such an august gathering of people. And uh, we th certainly think that we can play a role in ending the, the scourge of poverty, hunger, and malnutrition, which is, a, I think, a goal that's pretty universally shared. And if we can be part of that, we think we can play a role. What, what are Walmart trying to achieve? We're trying to, trying to sell to our customers safe, affordable, and sustainable food. And if we can do that, then our customers will come back and come back and come back. And that's what, we're, what we try to do. And what do we mean by sustainable? When we talk about sustainable, part of it's a commercial sustainability. We need everybody in the chain to make profit for this to work. And it's very important to us that the whole chain from the seed manufacturers, from the 
from the growers to the distributors to the people who are filling our stores. Everybody is making profit in the chain to make this work. And the market will determine that. And the role that we can play in, in, in making that market, I think, is quite important to make sure there's a profitability all the way through the chain. And that's a sustainable part of our, our model. The other part of sustainability that's very important is we need to use less agricultural input to create the crops and the products that we're selling. We need less water, we need less land, we need more better use of sunlight, we need better use of the resources, the fertilizers, the pesticides. We need to, and we need to produce more food from that and technology will play a key role in that. How do we achieve that going forward is part of our sustainability, the lens of sustainability that we put on everything that we sell. So effectively, we're kind of breaking this down into four kind of strands of, of activity right across the world where we operate. And my primary responsibility is the United States, and there's some really interesting things happening here that we've learned from other countries and vice versa. So what, um, what do we mean? Go, going direct to farmers is a, is a big step that we've made over the last few years. How do we go direct to farmers and truly understand how to create products, get the products that the customers want to, want to and jumping over some of the middlemen that have, have operated in that space. We've got a program in, in Central America, Terra Fertile, which is dealing with thousands of farmers directly, doing some, doing some of the education that you were talking about. How do we educate farmers to put less input? How do we educate farmers to be more efficient in what? And the, the thing that we can give in that context is we can give a guarantee of the product being sold at the marketplace, and we can give a guarantee on the price that it's going to be bought at. And a lot of the conversations that we've had this morning is at that end of the, we haven't talked much about the end of the chain because I think somebody said, well, what happens the year that the prices collapse and what happens to those farmers and those families and those communities when that happens? Walmart can play a role and we can play a role in trying to make sure that when the product comes, the farmer knows what the price is going to be and the volume is going to, going to be there. And we've got similar programs working in India and China and we've just started in South Africa with some similar programs in terms of working with that. And that Terra Fertile program helped us, helped us with a local program in the United States where, as President Obama said this morning, there's hunger and malnutrition operating in the United States. And off of it, often it's in rural communities mm -hmm. where the farming and the agricultural sector has gone away. And how do we go back to places like the Mississippi River Delta, which has got fertile land? and re-energize the communities. Often we've got stores in those communities and how do we re-energize the communities and connect with those communities? And we've got some great work going on with a number of farmers in, in that environment. And we've we set a commitment that we're gonna sell more than 10% of all the produce that we sell. We sell $8 billion of produce. We're gonna sell 10% of that that come from local sourcing. And that's, we're pushing, we've just achieved that objective and we think there's more we can do. Customers like it because the local food's fresher, it's better quality, it's not been distributed as far, and they like to support the local community. And I think one of the things, when I saw the Mozambique clip, that it's, it's really enriching to see families and communities coming alive when they've got a product that's selling, and that there's a customer that wants it. There's a sense of worth as well as a sense of economic value that is truly inspiring when you get to see it and get involved in it. And it's something that is a, is a great privilege of my job to be able to see some of those things happening. The other things we're doing, the second thing we're working hard at is, is infrastructure, investing in infrastructure. It's not just producing the product efficiently, it's getting it to the market as efficiently as we can. And we all know the number, the, the fertile areas of the world, trying to get it to the market if it, without it going, being spoiled is one of the big challenges. So we've committed to investing a billion dollars in chill distribution, in trucks, in, in, in processing facilities that can handle products effectively. And that's something that we're, we're working hard at in very different parts of the world. Third thing we, we, we believe a lot in is, is research, working with the NGOs and the, the universities and government agencies, working really hard to try and make sure we're finding ways to do things more efficiently. We, we, we've been working with some Israeli technology, which is a lot about water. How do we use water more effectively? And there's probably no better place to go and understand how to use water effectively than some of the Israeli technology in terms of how does drip irrigation go to the next step? How can it be afforded and invested in appropriately? So we've got some work going on on that space, which we're pretty excited about. In Mexico, we've done some work with them. Um, how do we use um, with, with some work again done with, with some universities using different sorts of netting so that our grapes grow more effectively and faster in, in Mexico. And I was tasting some grapes the other day, absolutely fantastic, and using much less sunlight, sunlight and producing much faster. 
So there's lots of great technology going on. And the, the exciting thing to being a retailer actually is you can really, you can taste and eat the product and make it come alive for you. And that's what I think, I think that's what the farmers really want to see. They want to see customers enjoying their product and buying their product and making it come alive. Because as Jeff said, and everybody's taught, it's a people business and making that come alive is, is, is pretty exciting in terms of how that all works. And, and the other thing, the fourth thing that we're doing is in this sustainability space is we're, we've, we've come up with a produce scorecard to try and get through the, the kind of myths about what's efficient and what's not efficient, what's sustainable and what's not, not sustainable. So we've got a, consist, a consortium of a number of people who, from all parts of the chain, who've tried to come together and say, how do we compare different input costs? How do we compare the relative sustainability? And we've got something called a, a produce scorecard that we're trying to work with people, which ultimately I think will be a customer driven thing. We'll be able to communicate with customers. How how efficiently was this produce produced? And transparency for our customers in all of these issues is becoming a very big issue. Was, again, I think Bono talked about it earlier. Transparency in the food chain is something that I think we've got to welcome and encourage. And sometimes I think we've been a bit, we've, we've been tempted to hide behind some of the, some of the challenges that we face as an industry. And um, so that's the kind of fourth thing that we're looking at. And to be quite honest, Walmart's really ready, willing, and able to work with all and any of you to try and make some progress on this because ending the scourge of hunger is a big issue for us. And well, I think you've taken us to, the, the, to this big topic of sustainability, uh, which brings uh, with it transparency and uh, that uh, famous uh, catchword, uh, traceability, uh, understanding all the, the chain and, and actually looping all the way back to, to the farmers. Uh, I remember when we were in our exchange uh, introducing uh, trading of pea beans, white pea beans, uh, it turned out that uh, you know, the market actors, when we were setting the standards, said we have to separate the roundish from the flat uh, beans. And I thought, wow, that's really splitting hairs. But you know, we did. And then it turned out that the, the round ones had a, a much more significant uh, price premium. And so what we saw is that the farmers, because now they, they could see that the, the pricing was separate and that the round beans were getting a much higher price, uh, went back to the seed uh, suppliers and said, we don't want to buy just any old pea bean seeds. We want the round ones, the ones that will produce the round pea beans because those fetch a higher price because that's what goes into those big bean uh, cans that people eat when they go camping or for breakfast in the UK. The, so, hmm? the great thing about that is it's the customer that's driven that change. It's exactly. not someone in the chain deciding what is exactly. the customer that's driven exactly. that change. And nor was it the seed company. It was really yeah. the market uh, bringing that information back. So when I think about traceability, uh, I think we need to, to always think that it's not just a one-way chain. Uh, so knowing that the farmer, you know, produced things in an environmentally correct way and that their children are not on the farm, you know, child labor and all those things matter. But what also matters is that the 200,000 farmers in uh, Dyborn's organization know what uh, US or UK or, or Chinese consumers value uh, at the retail. Uh, and so, Daibon, let me come back to you because we're really now going full circle in our chain. Uh, back to you uh, to give us a sense of how can that two-way uh, information flow be fostered? How can we strengthen that um, so that, in fact, uh, you loop back uh, with that information to demand for uh, the types of seeds that make you more commercially viable uh, and uh, vibrant in the market? Thank you. Indeed, it's got to be a two-way process. One, we should be able to market what the farmers are growing traditionally, but more importantly nowadays, you should be going to the market, find out what the market wants, and come back and teach the farmers that this is what the market wants and this is the standards that they want in terms of safety, in terms of quality, and the volumes that you need to, to, to have. And we've done that successfully in NASFA. Uh, when we started introducing groundnuts back into the system, we saw that we were producing so much we needed to export. But when we went back to the export markets that we had lost as a country, Malawi, we found that the groundnuts that we were producing, CG7, is darker, it's got more oil, and the market didn't want it. They wanted a smaller nut that was more uniform, a nut that has got less oil. And we went back and started working with ICRISAT to develop that particular kind of nut uh, so that we could access the market. And now we are successfully exporting through fair trade to Europe because that is what the market demanded, and we were able to go back to the farmers and say, this is what the market wants, and help them on how to produce that. And right now, as an organization, we are now having smaller farmer producers that are producing seed 
to supply to our government's farm input subsidy program. They uh, require about 2,000 metric tons a year. It's a growth industry. NASFAM over the last two years has been providing between 500 and 700 metric tons of that requirement, uh, producing seed for their fellow farmers. Excellent. So, uh, on that point, let me also ask Janet. I mean, uh, because you, you play obviously a very important role uh, in this conversation. So, uh, we know what's out there in terms of technology, but then we get uh, feedback from the market. How do you look back to, to, to the production? Yeah, uh, our relationship with the farmers is quite close. And then we direct them, I mean, we give them information from those we supply. Uh, the buyers will let us know the type of uh, variety they need, and then uh, we give that uh, information also to our partners in extension, so that they can teach the farmers the right protocols for producing that particular variety. Because uh, the important thing here is produce and be able to sell. But the bottom line about farming that we have made farmers to understand is profits. So approach your farming activity as a business. So that we must always make sure that whatever the farmers are producing is what the, the market needs. And that information we carry from the, uh, the buyers back to the farmers, even though we've been cautioned to have less meetings, but we really have a lot of those meetings because we need to talk to the farmer <laughs> to get him understand what the market needs. So that you just don't plants, and then at the end of the day, you harvest and you cannot uh, send it anywhere. So we are very particular about information flow from the farmers to the uh, market, from the market back to the, the farmers. So we do that uh, a lot. My, my, yes. My, my experiences around the world, um, there's m many, many more similarities amongst growers mm -hmm. than there are differences. And sometimes we get into this discussion on you know, the uniqueness of Africa or the uniqueness of sub-Saharan Africa. Smallholders around the world have, there's a tremendous similarity and frankly, there's a lot of similarities between smallholders and large producers. If you make a mistake as a smallholder, everybody in the family goes hungry. If you make a mistake as a big farmer, the bank takes your farm. So they're even more focused on markets and what makes sense and selecting the right varieties and, and my experience with smallholders is um, they're really focused on family income and they're really hungry for market data and they're really hungry for what that crop is worth on any given day. And, and I thought the presentations at lunchtime were so cool. Yeah. A, because they're young people. B, they're 120 seconds. <laughs> C, C, which is we could learn something. C, um, the leverage in data and getting live data and transactional information all the way back to that grower really helps them decide whether it's flat beans or round beans in the same season that, they, that they're going to plant. And at the moment, that takes far, far too long. But they, they understand, in my experience, they clearly understand the leverage of information. Absolutely. I was just going to say, I think from a consumer perspective, you know, an event like this to have less meetings is break this thing down and move it to action quickly. A lesson we just learned recently, an example is, you know, some of the egg shortages around the world, and we're leaders in poultry research. And you just quickly do some breakdown of the food economics of what consumers want. That is one of the most desired proteins right now, is getting an egg in those first thousand days, once a day or every other day to a child, what that does to brain development is, is significant. Well, when you just look at the simple facts, there's some, some, some scary statistics. Six and a half billion chickens produce about 174 eggs per person per year. But in the next 35 years, we need 100 more eggs. Mm. And if we stay on that, so then you unravel it of what scared us, we looked a little further, is we're losing an egg per hen per day right now. Why? Lack of innovation. We haven't been innovating in that space as much. And that's where the world's going. They want eggs maybe even more than a chicken breast, okay? Uh, the majority of the world. And the other thing is when you unravel it and you look at it, it is, it is uh, the, way, the way animals are raised. And there may be that 2% that have the money that maybe want them raised a different way, and they are suddenly finding they're losing three to four eggs per year. And so people that can't even 
have eggs themselves are exporting to those countries. And Mexico is exporting to Europe, and Europe has a major egg shortage at this point in time. So hanging on the walls of some of our poultry researchers are we need to come up with two eggs per day or two, two eggs per hen per year. That must change. That trend must be turned around. And there's three drivers. More innovation. Um, two is more understanding of animal well-being and market access and not letting a minority choice overrule a majority choice. This to me is a major dynamic going on in food. And three is being able to move protein around the world. So having trade standards, keeping the codexes and the scientific standards at least in place so that there's always politics in food, but being able to make sure the smaller countries can have that. To me, that's, that's taken the reality after a meeting like this. And why I'm excited about this meeting too is bringing this to the forefront. So it's gonna take policy. It's gonna take understanding some simple realities and also allowing that minority that can afford it just to be careful not to make the choice for the majority. Excellent. Well, we have a few minutes, so uh, in the uh, wrap-up, let's just think about a few things that have really come to the fore. People, 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 partnerships, sustainability, eggs. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Two> more eggs. <laughs> uh, more eggs. Uh, but really, as we, as we think about that, let me also throw out one last point, which is the youth angle. And maybe... Uh, and so, Daibon, let me come back to you because we're really now going full circle in our chain. If we can develop innovations, if we can develop technologies and productivity that attracts youth to stay in the village and farm, I think we'll have made great strides. And that's the way to go. Excellent. So, Sam? Let, me, let me pick up on a couple of themes because, um, you know, we've talked about what it takes, you know, to, be, to have innovation. And it takes, it takes an accountable public sector. And, you know, we've talked about that the public sector needs to change to be more modern, but it also needs to change to be more accountable. And so we need to have accountability all throughout the chain. Uh, you know, this is an era of digital, as we were seeing at, at lunchtime. And so to bring the digital revolution to, to agriculture is, is a challenge we all have to do that. But to also make it relevant to the youth. I mean, EFAD has a, has a program that is just focused on that, of trying to make the, the farm more resilient, a place that, that, um, that the youth want to stay and work. So that's, that's very important to us. And again, focusing on, on the mothers, the women, you know, that, that can actually make it, the communities more vibrant. So those are all important things to us. I, uh, I, I'm I think young people are the key to this puzzle. If, you, you know, on the earlier uh, panel, the vote on is this going to take 10, 20, or 30 years, um, the 13 to 15-year-olds today are the plant scientists, the agronomists, the economists, the retailers of, uh, of the future. Uh, and in my end of this, it takes seven years to breed a new seed not biotech, just a regular seed. It takes seven years, and, you, and there's no shortcuts in that. So if you think about this, I think it's curriculum development in school and how you teach biology and how people um, look at agriculture as a really sexy place to be. Yeah. It's one of those secrets that we know, but we have to do a much better job explaining how cool agriculture is. It used to be, you go to parties and people say, what do you do? And you say, I'm in agriculture. And they kind of say, oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> How unfortunate. Real conversations. Now, now, when you go to parties, everybody wants to talk about agriculture. Everybody's got an opinion. And I'm, I'm optimistic because I think there is a place for bringing young people back into agriculture because of the diversity and the breadth of the career opportunities. And the last piece is, when you leave these shores and you go nearly anywhere else in the world, farmers are women. Mm -hmm. And the challenge, and they do a good job, they're the CEO, they're the CFO, they're the decision maker on that farm. <laughs> Daughters on those farms have a really, really tough time. Yeah. And bringing education to those farms and helping them upgrade those little businesses makes a fundamental shift at the family level, at the village level, and the community level. So I, I, I really like the lunchtime piece. And when we're back here next year reporting on progress, I'd get a whole bunch more of those 122nd young people uh, on these chairs. We'll go outside and do the lunchtime piece. <laughs> All right, well said. Uh, Janet? Yeah. 
I think there's no uh, argument about uh, trying to encourage youth into agriculture. But I think there are certain descriptions we use for farmers that makes the young graduates not to go into farming. We are poor farmers. We are poor farmers. So already it's in your mind that yeah. I'm, you're not going to prosper going into agriculture. So I think some of these uh, descriptions also go to uh, deter the youth from going to agriculture. But I want to see a situation where there's the appropriate environment for the youth to take up agribusiness entrepreneurial skills. And I even think that once we see these educated ones leading, leading the, 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 the agri sector, it then tells, uh, in quotes, the poor farmers that after all, this is a noble profession and that can rather bring a lot more people to pay attention to agri and want to be part of it. I think there's two kinds of hunger. There's the physical hunger, which we've talked about, but there's also a hunger inside all of us that I think is stronger uh, than, than the physical hunger, and that's just to, to be part of a movement, to be part of something that's going to make a difference. And as just has been said, I think it's those 20-year-olds and those teenagers that, uh, and the 30-year-olds that are going to turn this thing. There's a positive ending to this story, and it's sooner than we think. And I think it's the, the evangelists in this room, these cause-centered leaders in this room, and a platform and an event like the G8 in this meeting, that what we may do in the next six months as our own leaders and unlocking the hunger in those future leaders could be the difference. And to me, I think that's, that's the secret ingredient of what we need to do, leaving this meeting so we don't need to have so many of them. I would agree with a lot of what was said earlier about the women's economic empowerment that comes from agriculture, and that would be a real kind of aspiration for Walmart in this. As, we, as I was talking about our Terra Fertile program down in Central America, 50% of those farmers are women, and all the way you go around the world, it's exactly you what you see. You see women who are providing the opportunity to really drive our agricultural sector. And if we can turn agriculture into a really vibrant growth engine for us. I think that'll be a great, great outcome of this, um, this session. So I'm looking forward to working on it. Thank you. Well, I think we're out of time. This reminds me of uh, just a quick story about uh, former president of Osanjo uh, about a year and a half ago in Accra telling the story of how on his passport he has farmer uh, under occupation. And uh, so he arrives at, uh, at the immigration and he's asked, uh, what do you do, sir? And he said, I'm a farmer. And they said, no, you, what do you actually do? Because you can't have come on a plane uh, and arrive here and tell us you're a farmer. And he said, no, I'm a farmer. So maybe that's what we should all be thinking, following what Janet was saying. That, uh, that this is what we're all trying to do, is to be farmers, to be innovators, to think outside of the box, to think about people and about uh, sustainability and accountability and essentially building that capacity and that potential uh, that's, that's out there and bursting to, to come out. So thank you very much. Thank this you. has been a really exciting uh, session. We've gone all over the map and along the value chain, and I'd like to thank you and wish you a good rest of the afternoon.